We'll just begin as people are coming in. My name is Shanera Johnson. I'm a panelist uh, supervisor for Rise Up Animation. Uh, below me is Melira Poland. She is a volunteer for our uh, panelist department. And she actually was very helpful and awesome in bringing the creative to crew, crew for uh, Dead End Panel Mall Park. So um, just letting you know with Rise Up, it is a um, nonprofit. Uh, and we're here to increase diverse talent in the animation industry, providing uh, uh, people of color with industry advice, portfolio feedback, uh, resume feedback, and the tools needed to turn their dreams into reality. And um, the uh, the reason why we have our uh, Dun and Pamela Park here is to uh, have them share their uh, story and their journey into working into the animation and uh, working together as a team. And uh, basically, what was their challenges and what was their success in running a very popular show on Netflix? Um, so, um, just letting you know, below me is our co host, Maria Poland, and um, I'm just going to let her uh, just introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Maria Poland, and I'm a production and development coordinator at Care Animation in London, um, and also a panelist. Um, volunteer here at Rise Up and this is my first panel that I've put together um, and I'm so happy to see everyone here and thank you for all your time and uh, I'm just gonna let everyone introduce themselves so I'm gonna start with um, the creator of uh, Dead End Paranormal Park Hamish. Hi um, yes, I am the creator of Dead End Paranormal Park, <laughs> um, also known as Dead Endia, which is the name of the books that um, it was based on, which I also made. And um, yeah, I, I worked as the showrunner, but that's, um, as I'm sure you've discussed on this, that's kind of a made up title, or at least in the UK. Um, I was technically the executive producer slash supervising writer. Nice, nice. <laughs> All right. Um, let's uh, pick someone random. Uh, Melissa, you're next. Hello. Um, <laughs> my name is Melissa Malone. I am like just a general, like all around designer for animation. Um, on this specific show, I was the background supervisor for both seasons. And also, I did a little bit of location design the first I think it was the first six episodes so um yeah I'm really happy to see everyone again it was like a really amazing experience working on this show so I'm excited to talk about it all right and what's uh uh Ryu you're next um I am Ryu Zanubu I'm a character designer um a lot more specific I'm not I don't have a huge range of like skills but I am a character designer I was a lead character designer for uh, Dead End here, Dead End uh, for seasons one and two I uh and yeah I've just been working as a character designer in London ever since I graduated so um also great to see everyone again and see so many familiar faces so oh and I also worked that carrot for a moment as well so I didn't realize Marie like you're a carrot but that's awesome um yeah oh wow that's awesome yes yeah. represent <laughs> Hi, Ilaria. Hello, I am Ilaria Ponticelli and uh, I work uh, in animation. It's been quite a lot now, 17 years. Uh, and I've worked for, let's say, quite a lot of different departments. And in the last seven years, I specialized in layout. And I have the honor to supervise the TV show The End, The Dendia, which is The Dendia for me. And uh, <laughs> it was really fun. All right. And I got uh, Domarine, did I get you as well? Or uh... yeah. I think I'm last. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, but yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Domarine Fox. Um, most people just call me Domi. Um, I'm an art director, production designer, and uh, visual development artist for animation. Um, I'm currently doing series development, like series design development, but for Dead End, I was the art directors for season one and two. And thank you for having me on this panel. It's really nice. Well, thank you. Uh, so that now we're done with introductions. Now, uh, 
my next question is going to be basically a general one, and that is, um, what made you guys want to work in animation? I'm just curious. I can start. Um, or do you want to go fast, Ree? Um, okay, sure, I will. Um, for me, I know I was raised on. Okay, so most of my childhood was like spent like horizontally watching television, I can admit to that. And um, it was a ton of animation, a ton of films, a ton of like just media. And um, I think I realized from a young age, I, I wasn't actually the kind of person who drew a lot as a kid. I spent a lot of time in my own head, in my own imagination. But it was around when I was like a teenager, like 16, um, 17, that I realized that like, I would like to spend most of my time getting those ideas out onto paper. And when I thought about those ideas, they always kind of read as um, animation in my mind they looked like the kind of stuff I was watching like Justice League Teen Titans and stuff like that so I decided from like just my teenage years that I just wanted to um, get into animation specifically character design I knew I wanted to draw characters and make that happen and then um yeah it, after after making that like single decision I suppose I kind of like beelined towards that and um ended up here but yeah and that's what kind of got me into animation was just like just trying to get those ideas in my head out onto paper and just trying to kind of like make a living out of that I suppose take it away Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if there was going to be like some cool take it away um <laughs> uh yeah I mean I uh I wanted to get into animation because um I like to tell stories um I've always liked to tell stories and I working in animation um realized more that I like to help people visualize like realize their stories as well so I come from a um a, an Iraqi background so I've had quite a rough um, upbringing with like the wars um and animation is just such a a unique and can be a very individual vehicle to tell a story um and to tell often tough stories or um like challenging stories um, so ever since I was young, I, I always knew that I wanted to tell like the story of my family. And as time has gone on, I've, I've just, I just love how the medium can help people tell unique and individual stories of their own. So I like, I like to help in that process. And that's my story of being in animation. <laughs> I can go next. Uh... Well, I decided I wanted to work in animation when I was 10 years old, because I read it on a random newspaper that it could be a job. So I just went, decided I want to do that. And I, I tried to get there in using everything I could do. Uh, I'm from Italy, so in Italy it's a bit difficult to get in animation. It's a small industry, very, very small one. Um, so it was quite difficult, uh, but I kind of managed. So my my background is a bit uh, unconventional. I didn't go to like, a, you know, uni or like had a degree. So it, my like my background is more like experience, I would say. Um, and of course, I've done a lot of uh, studying hearts and fine hearts and all that stuff. And then I eventually managed to end up in the animation world. And yeah, that's it for me. Uh, I can go next. Um, I feel like my origin story is not super unique. I also just grew up watching a lot of cartoons and watching a lot of you know, we didn't have like a lot of channels on TV. So we had like all the same, we had like four or five VHS tapes of like Disney movies that we would just rewatch and rewatch like every weekend. Um, and I remember always being kind of more interested in like the like aesthetic of what the animation looked like as opposed to, you know, the more technical stuff or the actual animation. Um, so yeah, I remember like watching those um, Klasky Supo cartoons, like the Wild Thornberries and always being like, oh, the lines are so wobbly and the noise and always, you know, thinking about the patterns and things. So when it came to going to university, I chose animation over like kind of fine art or film or anything like that, because I, I always considered animation to be more, I don't know, like 
you don't have to adhere to such a set of rules like you can break perspective you can like there's no you don't have to go out and like find each individual set piece and source things and you know I, I just thought that was like amazing that you can just invent anything you can invent any kind of world and they can look any way um and yeah I think I just always um I always kind of moved in the direction of the backgrounds and the design and colors and stuff and um yeah here I am maybe I think nine or ten years later still doing it <laughs> Yeah, I loved animation as a kid. Um, I think one thing that um, happened to me was I didn't have many friends and I liked to stay in the kind of computer room at lunch break and they had animation software. I kind of self-taught myself Flash um, and then stole it from the school computers. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, I... At the time, it was kind of new grounds, kind of flash animations, kind of um, cartoons that would use like retro sprites from games and things. And so I just kind of self taught myself uh, during all my, my kind of teenage years. And I think when the time came to decide, like, what do you actually want to do for a career? That was kind of when stuff like Adventure Time was just starting and this kind of new wave of very, I guess, creator-led um, animated shows, which all came from these kind of weird, rough and ready shorts that you could watch as well, like the original Adventure Time pilot. So it kind of, I, I knew I would love to have met, like directed movies and tell stories as like Tommy was saying, but there was something about animation which was attainable in my head in the sense that I had the software that the actual professionals were using at the time I could somehow make something resembling a like film even if it you know wasn't just with um again the aforementioned loneliness <laughs> and uh wanting like a project to work on to sort of give myself an excuse um and yeah, I felt really um, lucky that I kind of realized that that was a career at that time. And um, it kind of leads a little bit into where the show comes from because it was through watching these like pilots and shorts for other shows that I eventually submitted stuff to shorts programs, um, which is where this like original dead end short uh, came from. Um, which was about 10 years ago now, but, and the, our show isn't necessarily like connected to that, but it's, um, you know, that's where these characters kind of first came from. Yeah, so I uh, noticed that, uh, cause I actually found the short and it kind of reminds me of like the really old school Adult Swim uh, shorts that came out back in the early 2000s. And, you know, I was like, I, I find it was I thought it was a uh, pretty funny and uh but it was kind of like a, a like a slight deviation from the dead end that is in 2022 uh so how did that uh so when you guys well Hamesh when you was pitching it to um uh for it to become a series uh what was the things that you decided to change from the original short to the current series um, well, the short was made by Cartoon Hangover, which halfway through production kind of changed their business model from being adult animation to kids animation. Hmm. Um, they found, they had a show called Super Effers, but not, can I swear? I don't know. Um, <laughs> and they, well, it's relevant for if this goes up on YouTube because halfway through making that show, they realized that if they called it that, they'd have to be demonetized. And that was their like entire business model. So there are jokes in the original short about like porn and like some really weird, uh, as, you know, it's not really kids, but it's, um, we actually, that's the clean version. We like cut a bunch out. Um, so, Basically, it eventually arrived at this weird kind of YA type um, thing, and we pitched it around. And basically, between that short and the new show, I 
adapted it into a graphic novel series where I pitched it as YA. And so um, that's still kind of a slightly underutilized um, age group for animation. Um, so in a comic form at the time, especially, um, the comic form allowed it to kind of become what it eventually became, which is still like a comedy, still aimed at kids, but it does, um, I guess, it's allowed to tackle some slightly heavier topics, um, have slightly older characters. Um, so I didn't think too much about the shorts when we came to make it, just because we were adapting the book series. Yeah, so when I was watching the, the current series, it you are like, um, I did get that vibe where it was, you know, children can still watch the show, but, you know, people who are my age, I'm, I'm like 13, I guess, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, will be able to enjoy it. And, you know, adults and uh, not only just kids, but their parents as well. And I uh, do notice that um, uh, because uh, the main characters are LGBT, um, that it also goes into the aspects of their family as well. And to show that their, you know, family, um, although they they're, uh, want to be supportive of their child who are uh, LGBT or trans, um, but they don't know specifically how to, you know, be totally supportive. Like, uh, I like the episode where the grandmother basically does not understand Barney's transition uh, to become a male. And, you know, there was a scene where he basically said, no, mom and dad, you don't understand. Like, you're supposed to support me, but you're just basically brushing me aside to make someone else feel, feel good. Um, so I do like that aspect because not all family is going to be 100% in your decision, you know? Um, there's still going to yeah. be some uh, feedback, yeah. The the feedback has been like very very positive, um, but that the scene you were talking talking about is definitely one discussion debate. Some people think Barney's being rude and unjust, but that's kind of what we wanted. We wanted him to not necessarily be always in the right just because he's the main character, um, and in fact. Just to talk about adaptation, one of the changes we made was that in the books, the reading is a solitary experience largely. So they're very much told from Barney's point of view and his parents in the books are very much an unseen kind of bigoted sort of plot device. You don't really know what they look like or who they are. And then when we came to writing, which is, it, to go through the kind of pipeline was the first stage. Um, we started writing season one in October 2019. And I guess we didn't want to demonize them as much as the book does, which is very much, um, as I said, like Barney's point of view. We felt like there could be lessons for kids and parents um, and talking points for them. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty, it's not a, it's, it's never been a faithful adaptation to like the plot points. It is quite loose, but the, I think the tone and the spirit is there. And um, yeah, that was something we were really excited to tackle that I don't think the comics or the kind of YouTube shorts could have. Cool, cool. Uh, and now that we're uh, now that the show uh, turned from a uh, from a short to a graphic novel to web comic to <laughs> to a uh, to an animated series, um, I just had a question for um, uh, Domi. Uh, you were the art director. Um, what was the challenges in transit from uh, adapting? the three mediums, if you think about it, into a series, because that could be, in my mind, that could be daunting, because people have expectations. <laughs> so. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, there's there's two things to to really think about when you're adapting any anything. Um, there's the creative, there's the creative part of the adaption, but there's also 
the limitations of what you can actually create and put on a screen. Um, a, a large part of my job is is thinking not only about the creative, but about like like the managerial side of things. What what are our resources? What can we actually do? What software are we working with? Um, fun things like how many characters can we have per, per like script or per episode? How many backgrounds are we allowed to paint? And that has that ties in really heavily with the creative side. Um, because I mean, for, for Dead End, uh, it was really important to um, be like taking reference and, and uh, inspiration from the comic. So a big part of the comics that I loved was the colors. Um, and we had this kind of recurring color theme going through the series, which was uh, like this pink, magenta, and green, which you can see in almost every background and every location. Um, and you know, sometimes you think, okay, well, it's it's kind of like a it's kind of like a economic decision to have these these uh, these palettes that are kind of like um, not monochromatic, but like centered around pink and green. But at the same time, you're using that as uh, like inspiration from the comic. So it's it's kind of a two way street, if that makes sense. So that's some of the challenges. It's like tying in the creative with the uh, with the economic challenges of making a series. I hope I answered that in a way that makes sense. <laughs> no, uh, no, actually, you did, and. Uh... You know, I'm interested in like the uh, the managerial side of animation as well. And uh, Melissa, uh, since you, uh, hey, since you, uh, uh, speaking of backgrounds, what was your challenges in creating the uh, world of Paranormal Park uh, in terms of backgrounds and design? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I feel like as a background department, we were very, lucky on this production because um, Domi and Alaria always made sure to give as much reference material and support as possible, like more than I've ever had on any other project. And um, we would have been provided with, you know, maps and, um, you know, and like concept images for absolutely everything and a layout for absolutely everything. So that creative side wasn't so much of a challenge for us. I was just like, it was crazy how supported the background department was. The challenge I would say for me would have been, was also probably managerial because we we realized pretty early on that we needed to expand the team. There was a lot more backgrounds than we expected. Um, we ended up with, I think that there was 12 people on the team, including me, um, which was a lot of artists to support and especially during a pandemic like everything ended up being different to what we expected like we weren't in house we had to like learn how to I had to learn how to essentially just manage over zoom which you know it was the best team ever thankfully but um you know it, it brought it, it brought its own set of challenges um so yeah I would say the main challenges for me were definitely um yeah like managing the number of backgrounds was sometimes difficult um we ended up relying on our production team a lot to help us with, you know, time management and things like that. Um, we ended up bringing on another supervisor in season two to help because there was just so there was just so much. We had a we had a reuse library which was really, which kind of saved us by the end. But by season two, we we were you know the layout department thankfully were like really good at reusing like certain angles and stuff. So. We, we ended up like hitting the ground running, I think by the time the second season started. Um, yeah, just because there was there was a lot more reuse and stuff, but yeah, I would say most of mine were pandemic related to be honest, which is yeah maybe another conversation. <laughs> just um, I just in. wanted to, Sorry, oh, okay. sure. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I know there's like some discrepancies between how US animated shows are done and often how British animated shows are done. Um, because we have like, we had a very extensive design department on Dead End who built the world. 
And we also had a, lay a layout team, which was absolutely phenomenal, which is uh, what Ilaria had supervised. And I, I, I don't know if this is the case, but I've, I've often read that you don't really get so much um, layout teams in American animation anymore, because you have the boards and then the background designers are doing the key backgrounds based off those boards. But actually what we had on Dead End was like, this insanely amazing layout team that we would feed big background packs to, which is what Melissa was talking about. We would have like every location designed as like a map and a concept and, you know, like little uh, bits and pieces that we'd done post board, um, which Alaria and her team would then, I mean, I'll, I can let her talk about it more, but they, they built like this, like they built the world like based on the designs and then Melissa's team went to town with the paint. It was, it was like a really incredible workflow. Um, all I was gonna say was that during the pitch of the show, we were like, why has there never been a cartoon series set in a theme park? And then multiple <laughs> times on the project, we realized why, <laughs> because <laughs> theme parks are extremely detailed and extremely busy yeah. and we'd just be like, uh, I think in season two, you may notice that there's a few times where the park seems a lot emptier than it probably should be <laughs> <laughs> on like an August uh, daytime. But yeah. yeah, it was a fun challenge, I suppose, in the end. You could just say it was still off season. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ilaria, since uh, you was a part of the um, layout uh, artists and supervisor, um, basically we probably do have some people who are like, what is a layout artist? So um, could you just describe like briefly like what uh, you do? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a fun topic because nobody knows what layout does. It's one of those jobs where you do in the background, like in the shades and you don't see what you do, but really helps the production and everything. Um, so basically we, we get the animatic from the storyboard and then we get the designs from our department and we make sure that everything is consistent in the scene and in the sequences. So we first decide how many backgrounds we have per episode, how many reuses we can do uh, according to the resolution we have and camera movements we have. Um, so we do big back breakdowns, uh, deciding like reuses and not, and decided the key backgrounds that background department is going to, to paint and do beautifully. Um, we, in the department, we also took care of camera movements. So we, every single artist was taking care of a whole sequence and like a tiny director taking care of camera movement from the whole sequence or so giving the emotion of what that sequence should give and making sure that, you know, speed wise and animation wise would that make sense. Um, and so basically the art department is like the, the, the blueprint of what the final shot will be. So we just like filter possible problems that could be a problem in future departments and like filter, filter them out and say, oh yes, we can afford this, let's do it. Or say, no, we need to change this and we put it back. So we, we sometimes had to change some sequences in storyboards because consistency wasn't working or like we had to reduce the amount of background because it was a lot of new locations. So we had to find ways to, you know, reduce otherwise this production wouldn't have be able to go through and do what we have done um, and also give the we did like a pre-comp version of for camera movements for comp department so they could get our camera and and do their you know take the nice animation and all the backgrounds that were ready so it's a bit like a, it's a huge department, but unfortunately it's not taken that seriously from many studios and productions in general. Uh, they always decide to cut on layout departments, which is, in my advice, a big mistake because 
you decide to cut a department and which these problems will fall into other departments if you don't have a layout department. Let's say a super basic thing, you have a background and you have camera movements and you are going to reuse that background in many shots. But without a layout department, you take the risk of drawing a background and you say, yeah, it's approved, it's ready. And at the end of the production goes to come, oh yeah, it looks nice. But then you realize that the camera movement, you need more background, you need more pixel around it. And you don't have it, why? It's because you miss layout department. And this is one example. And the other thing we do is the scaling of characters. So we put the characters in shot and make sure that the scale is correct and reframing, so fixing composition and like making sure that the composition is like cinematographically nice and works for until the end of the, the show. Because you have the storyboard, which sometimes are really rough and really, you know, you they're not super detailed. So we have to rework a layout to make sure that the animators could animate actually on the top of whatever background they have with correct perspective references and and all this stuff so this is what we do secretly behind the scenes and nobody knows about it yeah, it was, sounds I like was, oh go ahead I was, I was just about to say that sometimes the biggest departments are the ones that when they're doing a good job you shouldn't really be noticing them in a way because it looks so good and i think Dead End is something that I think looks really good. I think it, um, at first glance, maybe doesn't look like it's doing anything sort of like super new, but I think when people actually watch it, they appreciate how, I guess, filmic the compositions are and the way that the layouts and the compositing team work together to make some of those um, I've seen some people describe the show as like, it's kind of like 2D, 3D. And I'm like, it's really not, it's, it's not on that level, but it has um, just really interesting kind of depths of field stuff, which again, it's kind of from, um, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but um, it all starts at layout. And I would join Ilaria in saying people to people not to cut the layout department and keep throwing yeah. people into it to mm -hmm. make your show look good. Yeah. I would I wish you could see one of them. Talk. <laughs> Sorry. I, think what... I was just going to say, I wish you could see Alawi's tracking sheet because it's the most beautiful thing I've seen in my entire career. It's incredible. <laughs> I mean, <Sorry>. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on top of being it in a theme like park. Me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I keep, I keep nope. interrupting. Um, on, on top of being in a theme park, which makes it complicated, as a horror show, we really wanted to do loads of weird angles and like, uh, like we say, those kind of filmic references when it comes to the horror stuff. So there were lots of times when the, I was pushing the storyboard team to not uh, reuse the same backgrounds all the time or the same angles um, and trying our best to not make the show seem flat. Like I just didn't want it to be, uh, for a lot of comedy shows, it's fine when like characters are just on a flat background, but we really wanted that sense of scale of the park and uh, those spooky things. Unfortunately, that meant that a lot of the other departments had to work in a way that would be nuts on any other show. Um, but yeah, we we also tried to you know, can you say monetize? So like getting the cool shots, really well done, yeah. with good angles, and then maybe you know something you can get make it simple we simplified it so we yeah we, we knew on the how to shots and... exactly like our golden nuggets like throughout an episode and some some episodes were were more demanding on that kind of like cinematography or just in general like more immersion in the world um because you i mean some stories just required that that really deep immersion into a into a location or you know um the, the the mood and the process of making any show is just a lot of cut down or like you start with your blue sky idea for something and then you chisel away to you know what you can actually make and obviously the audience will never know what you've cut and so a lot of what we did talk about was 
fighting for those shots that maybe might not be necessary, but without it, the whole show would seem flat. So you need that variety. And they all did a great job. And speaking of variety, I do have a question um, to Rio. Uh, Rio, um, in terms of variety for the characters and the character design, um, what was the challenges that you had to face? And uh, did you actually have to put limitations on what you were able, had to create in terms of character design? Um, what yeah, were the obstacles? Definitely, there were definitely limitations in, um, and I don't say that in a bad way. I particularly, my the way I think is that with design, the whole point is designing within limitations. You don't just um, have a whole uh, breadth of chance to do anything you want to do. The idea is that, you know, you're given a box and you try to do really creative solutions within that. But um, Dead India was a rig, is a rig show, a Toon Boom Harmony rig show. So um, even though rigging and um, Toon Boom Harmony rig shows um, have their own benefits and pros in terms of like the kind of flexibility they offer, they also have their own kind of constraints. And um, I think especially for this show where we were kind of learning to make a show, learning to make a show in a pandemic, and then learning to make a show as a Toon Boom Harmony rig show, there were so many different levels of like, what we didn't know, what we did know, and how to figure those kind of things out as we went along. And in character design, it was specifically about um, making sure that we could get diverse shapes and um, interesting characters while still not overloading um, our rigging team with a bunch of new puppets every single time we made something. So it was a lot of like trying to figure out how we could reuse what we made before and then making that um, still feel fresh or unique and trying to make reuses still feel like um, when they're on screen together at the same time, they don't feel like, you know, we've just copied and pasted something or we've just kind of gone the most generic route possible. And um, that was a big challenge in sense, in the sense that we didn't have as much time as we needed during the, um, during the place of where we were in the show in terms of what time we were in production, we had to make certain decisions about um, how to make reuses work the best in terms of like, for example, um, for a lot of the secondary characters, they are based upon i think is it five or four puppets uh, so body types so we had an we had an average body type a child body type um a fat a fatter body type a muscular body type and we just kind of had those um bases to start off with and we had to kind of build those puppets and make sure that they had all these different options of ways we could go and then we would start building characters on top of those and we would do that for our secondary characters whereas our demon monsters and um, main characters and kind of like, okay, I said secondary, so tertiary characters were the reusers, but the secondary characters as well had unique body types as well. So we kind of reserved, um, we went down the list of what was most important and kind of tried to look about what would be on screen the most, who would be on screen often and decide about how we could get variety in that kind of way. And so, yeah, it was definitely, I think that is really like character design's job was trying to get the most out of a little really. And um, I think it was quite rewarding in that sense because it's always nice to kind of be like, oh, we figured it out in the end. And I think um, you just come up with way more creative solutions than you would have if you're like, you know, trying to, if, if you're trying to figure out how to be the most efficient you can be while also trying to like, you know, enjoy design and draw a bunch. So um, yeah, we, we managed that. And we had, a, we had a team that was quite junior to start off with. And um, so we had to kind of learn about character design, constraints, rigging constraints specifically, but then also about like um, using and figuring out how to draw with a line efficiently. And the team really did rise to the occasion. It was pretty amazing to see everyone um, kind of working from home because I, 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 when I joined the show, I had my interview in a satellite studio, but my first day of the show was when the government wanted to lock down. So I never stepped foot in the studio. <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I've been in the studio since, since I'm like, my friends are currently there still, and I still have yet to go back. But um, my entire time there, which was like nearly two years, I had never stepped in the studio. Like this room that you're seeing right now, this was where the magic happened. And so like, um, this is where all the design was happening. And for character design, it honestly wasn't a problem. Like, um, it was so easy. <laughs> it was so easy because production had made it incredibly easy for us to um, work from home. It was like, I think it was really exemplary, really. If I'm mean, obviously, we'll hopefully never have another pandemic again. But if we did, I feel like Blink, uh, Mystery Q, the studio that was making this would have a you know, they would, they would, they really rose to the occasion in terms of like helping us work from home and the character design team um, 
they were all really, really good at kind of rising to the occasion and like trying to like tackle these kind of constraints and stuff like that. But yeah, we definitely had those kind of challenges that came up all the way every time. I think uh, Ray is being also very gracious because we had a lot of challenges and I think when he joined um, the project um, we were working on designs at least for the main characters that had kind of been designed before he got there and a, a sort of show style had been set in stone and on top of that it was an adaptation so we always were trying to make sure that the character designs didn't stray too far from the looks of the book. Um, so he's talking about his team rising to the occasion, but he absolutely did. And I think the the chat, like it is, the challenges on this show were so huge. And I think now a lot of us are looking back quite fondly and it did get better towards the end, but there were really rough patches. And I think part of that was the, when the pandemic hit, a lot of us felt quite lucky because animation could continue. And, uh, you know, we kept just thinking, well, we're not affected. It's all good. I mean, we're working from home, but we get to keep going. And then all of those problems that are affecting all the other um, productions kind of hit us <laughs> sort of six months in, maybe. Um, and we really did have to change the way we're working. I, I mean, it, the transition was smooth. And I think, again, it, it got really good towards the end. But there was so much that we were missing out on. I'm sure you've talked to other teams and the story of making a show in, in pandemic is kind of tired by now. But like, I desperately wish we could have all worked together. And um, it's a kind of miracle the show, to be honest, it's a miracle the show came out when you think about how many productions didn't survive the pandemic and keep um, getting cancelled and things. Um, we all just were quite determined to get it done <laughs> and to prove that we could do it. Um, so there's a lot of love, a lot of pride and a lot of um, appreciation for each other on this team, I think. Nice, nice. Well, no. Well, um... We do have some questions from the audience. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Maria uh, to pick a question to see. Uh, uh, so Maria, what's the, what do you got? All right, let um, me go to first question. Um, uh, Dead End has a lot of campy and unique storylines. What is everyone's favorite episode? Who wants to go first? I go um, first. Go for it. <laughs> I'll go next. The musical episode and uh, the one before, <laughs> the 108. <laughs> I remember for number episode, the one in black and white where the Norma gets stuck in the movie TV world. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the musical might be a favorite for a lot of people. The day when the demo tracks came in from Patrick Stump was uh, a fun day. Don't think many people worked hard that day. <laughs> Maybe they did, they had to, but um, I know I was dancing a lot and not just to the music, but just like the excitement that like, yeah, this is actually going to be good. And uh, it felt really nice to have that in the kind of middle of production. Um, Uh, I feel like um, I really did like the musical episode. I think I'm thinking of it and like what something, what did I make that was really fun to make at the time? And it probably would have been um, the wrestling episode was really fun. I remember um, the team getting a chance to do a lot of fun special poses and character designs for that. And um, specifically something that I was able to draw, which is one interesting thing is all of us are leads. And um, normally with the whole lead job is that um, you know, a lot of it is people managing and not necessarily doing the work yourself um, in terms of like drawing, creating and stuff like that. But we all got stuck into the work in various different times quite a bit our, ourselves. So I'm sure we will have a favorite thing that we made. But um, the wrestling cards that came up in um, the wrestling episode, I really enjoyed that. Um, they, they were really, really fun to make. I don't know 
if um, I don't think there's ever been comp compiled yet, but if you watch the episode, you can maybe see bits and pieces of them. They're a really small prop that shows up every now and again, but they were just a, kind of like um, a fun thing to do. I found that I had a pocket of time that I was uh, able to have like really lean into them. And um, I kind of had a vision in my head of like, oh, I, I, it was just a fun time to draw a bunch of demons in ways that rigging wouldn't allow to do, but we could get them into the show somehow by illustrations and stuff like that. And so doing that was really, really rewarding. And um, I should definitely uh, compile them and put them online at some point because they're just really, really fun to make. Um, but yeah, that episode in general, wrestling episode was just like really fun. It was nice to see, because um, I grew up watching like WWE and stuff like that so like um it was fun to see those kind of tropes brought in and smashed together with monsters and like just kind of fun to look at so yeah that yeah mine is probably the musical episode boring answer but I would say maybe episode three as well I think it's episode three the fear worlds I always think like any show with like a ton of fantasy sequences is just always so much fun like how often do you get to draw a world made of hamster hair, you know? <laughs> but yeah, I think that was one of one of my favorites. I think my favorite is either 103 because of the fear worlds um, or the Hox's Castle episode, um, just because a similar reason, like they they both had some really unique visuals um, for 103, it was uh, designing uh, Norma's fear world um, in which, you know, she's she's kind of, she's going through something quite traumatic um, and we're trying to convey that feeling on screen. And for me, that was a challenge because I, I had to kind of put myself into the shoes of a character um, that I didn't, I, I will never quite understand and you know you're trying your hardest to understand what that character is going through so doing like the color scripts for for Norma's fear world was just so so unique and special um because it took quite a lot of like research and asking questions and making sure that you told that kind of story right um so yeah creatively either 103 or 105 with Fox's castle and the crazy 3D shitty 90 sequence at the beginning. <laughs> like that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, episode three was my favorite actually. The um the fear worlds being also abstract and then when it was Norma and it was like the real world is her fear world. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> that really got me. Oh, poor Norma. Um Okay, um, let's go to the next question. Um, we had two questions that were quite similar. Um, so, was Dead Ends production fully based in the UK or was there also a team in the US? If so, how difficult was it working with a sizable team dif time difference and how did you overcome it? Um, it was um, a largely UK team. Um, there were um, people in Ireland, there was someone in Brazil, um, little people dotted, not little people, you know what I mean, <laughs> people dotted around the world, but largely a UK team. I mean, one of, one of the benefits of the pandemic was not having to force everyone to be in the London bubble. Um, we were able to get um, our uh, main comp team is in Manchester, right? And then um, when it comes to the US team, that would be largely the actors and people from Netflix. Um, I spent a lot of, uh, because of the time difference, we did all of our cast recordings um, on a, like a Friday night, um, which was fine because it was the pandemic and I couldn't go anywhere. So <laughs> uh, it was quite a nice way to end the week. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was one of the things, it was probably naive and, and silly of us to try and make the whole thing in the UK. I know it's one of the ways that we face a lot of problems, um, but it was good as well, you know? Um, yeah, just to add on to what Hamish said, one thing I can say to that is that specifically for character design, um, it can be quite like challenging to get into it as a role, um, mostly because like, 
there are like all these people who want to be character designers for like this many jobs and then if you put on a location on top of that of like all of the jobs normally being in London more or less for like the bigger projects I suppose um it can get quite hard to like kind of jump into that role especially if you're a junior and um the good thing about it us all working in the pandemic and working remotely and stuff like that was that we were super open to like anyone at least in the UK like jumping onto the show and like you know no one was asked the question oh would you be willing to move which can be like a death sentence for your interview normally <laughs> and so like um instead I was lucky enough to work with people who were like in Wales at the time and stuff like that and they were able to jump onto a project that would um you know be a big part of their careers in terms of like onboarding them onto the next big job or something like that so um that was one cool thing about the uh working from home situation I think is that it kind of gave a lot of people um a chance to take a step up in their careers in certain ways um just being able to get access to certain um jobs that you know maybe won't be available to them in the first place so yeah there's well, like make... this uh oh sorry Nish we're, we're thinking on the same line. <laughs> well, go ahead, Nish. <laughs> were we to make, if we're going to make a season three or if I was growing up another show somewhere down the line, I'd really hope for us to be able to do a fusion of working from home and in the studio because um, everyone has different needs and has different ways of working. And like you say, I think the opportunities you can get from thinking a bit further, further afield uh are very beneficial i don't know all right so well uh i'm in uh new jersey right now so it's 12 27 so it's four it's almost 4 30. um we do have a couple of questions left are you guys willing to uh answer uh maybe one or two questions i am happy to I'm just yeah saying. definitely so I feel like we haven't uh covered like a yeah, super no huge ground <laughs> at the moment so I feel like I'm okay for like a few to go on really but yeah oh okay yeah. well thank you very much I appreciate it so see that's why you guys are awesome so uh hey uh let me see if there's anything here um there was a uh question that I thought was interesting uh so I'm just gonna read it for Micah um was there any was there ever any trouble getting the show greenlit because of how diverse it was uh, because of its LGBTQ representation, your know, divergent representation, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so. Um, yes and no. Um, I had been developing shows um, for about 10 years and pitching things and they all kind of tackled these themes. And so, uh, there were struggles at other places and some, sometimes things would be going really well on a project and then I'd start bringing up these themes and then suddenly the studio would choose something else. Um, I think there's been a lot of chat this year about Netflix's animation department choices. <laughs> um, I, I um, you know, I agree. It's all a bit chaotic and not cool. With that said, at the time when we pitched it, I do think Netflix were the only place that would make our show and give us the freedom we could and actually push us. I mean, I have told this story a couple of times, but in the early days of um, development before the green light, whenever the subject of Barney being trans or, or the queer stuff came up, um, I would kind of change the subject from a kind of survival instinct. <laughs> And Netflix asked Blink, um, the Blink juice is kind of behind my back, like, is Hamish okay talking about this stuff? Or he seems like a little bit embarrassed. And it, like I said, it was just a survival instinct to try and get the show made, but very quickly Netflix um, reassured us that they, this was like the reason they wanted the show. Um, and they kind of pushed us to make it as overt and clear as possible. But yeah, to say that there was no struggles or battles is not necessarily true. Um, but my overriding sense from the making of the show is how like lucky we were. Definitely. And and actually just through designing, like uh, through characters especially, I feel like there wasn't really any like 
there was no limits <laughs> like to to who we could like who we could design or like what we could design like it was every every time I would see characters come from Ryu and the team it would just be so like it would be a joy it was like there was so much heart and soul in, in every single character that was being designed and at some points it was like oh my gosh you know these are these characters are so unique and diverse they all kind of started to build little stories of their own through the production and then people would have their own head like head cannons on the on the series as well like who was working on it, it was really it was really fun um so yeah it felt obviously with the creative limit of you know as Ryu said working within that box in regards to the characters um it felt kind of limitless what kind of characters we could put in the show it was really quite special All right, Maria, and is there any other questions uh, you think uh, might be great to ask our uh, guests? That's the question that I uh, wanted to ask. I was wondering whether there was any specific challenges that came up or things that came up with it being a show directed to uh, young adults in the teen space. Was there anything that rose up from that being uh, in that sort of area that um, it, you could talk about? There are some des character designs that Rhea can maybe talk about, which we definitely had. Largely, the kind of standards and practice thing was very lenient. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there were some horrifying designs we had to tweak slightly. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I think we were kind of lucky, I guess, that it didn't happen as like, it didn't, there wasn't a constant conversation of, oh, change this, change this, change this. But there was maybe a balance of, um, especially with like maybe the demon characters and stuff. Wait, that actually reminds me, one thing that um, Hamish kind of described about demon characters in the show was that, um, oh, what was it? In terms of, it was terms of like, you wanted them to kind of look monstrous or horrifying or scary, but you also wanted them to be able to almost feel like a friend if 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 it went that way as well. Like, you know, in the sense that like they could be read as both a villain or something else. They could be read as an ally or something because there are times when characters cross that line, cross that line. And um, so that was kind of a fun way to kind of approach how we were designing them. But then there were times where, um, you know, we would maybe like push something and kind of have to pull back in terms of like maybe how uh monstrous or horrifying i suppose we were going for in terms of like oh this character is still a character and we want them to maybe still kind of read as a character i suppose in that sense but um i would say in terms of like what could we get away with what couldn't we get away with i did feel like we had pretty free time um in regards to like i i another show i've worked on is gumball the amazing world of gumball and um on that show we had a lot more issues with cartoon network get um smp like kind of being like change this no this implies something like this this is a bit strange like this and me and alari both worked on gumball so we had more times like that where things would have to be kind of like shifted and edited um at the character design stage um because of what they might imply and stuff like that and um but then on this show luckily i didn't find too many situations where that was the case <laughs> but Hamish which ones were you thinking of um there's a character that's a floating deer fetus oh my god that <laughs> yeah <laughs> is it the thing that was like pink and it, I was like yeah. this thing looks like horrifying but kind of cute at the same yeah. time yeah <laughs> in Ray's original design it was uh design it was bright red and had an umbilical cord like floating beside <laughs> it okay um there was a few characters there's like this other um thing in season two called Jojo that is like a big pile of like weird mess but again the first design was a lot more like flesh colored I think they kind of didn't like things the kind of body horror I suppose is what you'd call it mm -hmm. um styled down a little bit which is why I, I sometimes get a little bit jealous of some of the demon designs I see in um the Owl House which it's like a Disney show, but they seem to like go full body horror. I'm like, why couldn't we do that? Um, but yeah, largely we could do what we liked. And actually, despite the show being filled with demons, like most of the work was designing like random human park guests and like like concession stands and 
quite like grounded real world stuff. Oh, I do want to. I do want to say. I realize. I reason I don't remember is because I can't take credit for the deer fetus. Um, fortunately, oh, yes. that was actually uh, Jonathan, who was the lead character design before me. He was the deer fetus, and actually, you know, maybe Dominic, you were there for the creation of it too. So the deer fetus happened. Yeah. At that point. <laughs> I, put that, I put the deer fetus <laughs> in your hands. Um, so I wasn't there for that portion of it. But yes, I saw it and how it evolved into something more presentable on screen later on. So yeah. Well, I, I have a question. In... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was no, just going to say, go I had, uh, in the very rare time that we had in studio before the pandemic happened, um, I had brought in two books of uh, like Japanese demon lore. And I just said, let this inspire you <laughs> to Jonathan. And he, he created some absolutely crazy, cool demon designs he just went to town he had like four or five sheets just filled with like these uh like just demons inspired by Japanese law he'd also done some research as well into like different uh like demons from other mythologies and yeah that's where the demon <laughs> like the deer one came from <laughs> so yeah it was very very early and it kind of just like survived through because I think I think at the beginning we we said okay we can do five we can do five really unique and different looking demons and we had a sheet full and it kind of just sat with like four of the demons and looked very like wacky and different and bizarre <laughs> so it was really fun my yeah. favorite demon is the one that looks like a red worm and he just has like this 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 just this, this, this. <laughs> It's just like I don't care. God. And what? yes. Yeah, just with the face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and dear fetus. I want a doll, but uh <laughs> I just got a I got a, a whippet puppy and it basically looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the face, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. Anything else? Uh let's see. Maria, do you see any other questions? Uh that might be good too. Well, there was this one that says, what programs did you use to animate the show? And I think we already discussed that. It was Toon Boom, mostly. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, Toon Boom Harmony was for the animation. For character design, we were mostly in Photoshop. I mean, purely in Photoshop. We, um, I, was there any other proprietary design um, uh, that people used? For layout, uh, we were using Photoshop after effects. And Maya and Blender. <laughs> um, and Comp is also <laughs> <laughs> everything. Um, comp was also After Effects. Um, so it ran smoothly from the layout as well. Oh, cool. So you guys was like bas bas basically paperless, saving the trees, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And consuming energy, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure about other people but like I will say ever since kind of working in character design in, in in animation ever since that was like what I'm 28 now I started when I was 22 I haven't drawn on paper like in ages like I just haven't it's just not a thing <laughs> um so yeah it's all kind of just purely digital for me at the moment um yep, and yeah purely digital <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sometimes use post-its in the writing room which is always exciting oh cool. <laughs> Posts are great though. I like drawing on those. I will never give up give up on those. <laughs> okay, let's see. And it's 12 39. Uh Maria, any one last question? Uh that um from the chat box is a bit of a shout out. Is um someone said that uh, this is Jen, who the team will know. They just want to say that you're all legends. Um and uh yeah, is a true miracle work as he battles some really smelly circumstances so <laughs> just a hurrah for all of you really <laughs> Thanks, <Jen. laughs> it's very sweet jen's the show's producer and um the reason i find the word showrunner kind of weird is because jen was if you take this word literally jen was the showrunner like jen was in charge of all the schedules and the um the budgets and getting giving everyone their money and basically making sure the show actually happened. I guess I was more the, um, I would just like come up with the stories, but if we're gonna talk about departments that if they're doing, you know, a good job 
they are essentially invisible, then I feel like almost all conversation around animation doesn't give enough shout out to the production teams. Um, and our production team wasn't, um, you know, we're very experienced, but would never have the same experience, I guess, as like the big US shows. We were a new company, we were building something new, and then a pandemic happened. And again, these stories are kind of bored by now, but um, I couldn't have asked for a better team. And I hope I get to work with all of them again. Oh, um, if it's okay, I have a question for everyone while we're here, since we haven't seen each other in a while, I suppose, and we'll work to each other in a while. But um, since everyone's gone off to do like different things after Denendia, though, like what was something you took from the production of Denendia or learned from Denendia, dead end, and um, brought onto like the new projects you're on? Because I know you're in serious development now, Domi, and um, I'm freelancing in development myself. So, what are the kind of things that you've taken from that show and you know you're using elsewhere now? Um, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll start with like trust, um, biggest thing, any production any job, no matter how long or short it is, trust, like trust in your team, trust in your colleagues. Um, not just like, like professional, like professional trust, but also like, like part, like part, like personal trust in the, the talent that you're bringing onto your projects. Um, Make an app, your it's, team. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I, that's what I try to take onto my new productions or new jobs and that's what I that's what I want because dead end was just really just built on trust and understanding and I think that's why the team was so special like you know so much like there's quite a bit of time that's passed but a lot of people still talk about just how phenomenal the dead end team was and we're like how much we miss it how kind and considerate everyone was so yeah trust yeah trust and make like build an happy team based on trust and yeah a team basically what teamwork is because animation is teamwork is not like ego for individuals so yeah yeah i agree i think trust is the main thing um and like i feel like one of the challenges for me was trying to keep my team like challenged you know when you're in the same room every day and you're not you know like you're painting the same backgrounds all the time I feel like I yeah I really learned a lot about how to how important it is to like keep people challenged and um interest how to keep them interested when and, and how to be compassionate when there's so much else going on that's like way more important than making an animated show, you know? Um, yeah, I would say compassion, yeah. <laughs> um, I echo all of that. I think it felt ridiculous sometimes getting on Slack on Sundays during 2020 and 2021 to be like, okay, I need you to draw some <laughs> theme park cups now, even though who knows if theme parks will ever exist again, or I don't know, and keeping everyone's spirits up. I think when I, years ago, wanted to make a show, and when you have that dream, a lot of people are thinking about the end product and thinking, I want to run a show because I have a great story or I just want to do whatever. But like, that's not the job. And I think the actual job is, are you gonna be someone who can lead a team and keep everyone happy and motivated? And from the stories I've heard of people on the show, of other showrunners they've worked with, that can um, not always be the case. And there's definitely times I stumbled. And the thing I, I think I've taken from the show if I ever get this kind of opportunity again, um, but even on other jobs, is to not wait around if you see a problem or not, um, is to basically speak up and also listen. 
I actually did a writer's room for a different show this year, which obviously I can't talk about, NDAs and stuff, but something bothered me in like the very first thing that the person leading the room said. And this was a completely new room. No one knew who I was. I just had to say like, actually, that's really bad. That makes me feel uncomfortable. And I kind of like, I would have been too scared to say that. When I started this production, I was talking about avoiding the, those conversations with Netflix. Um, I thought that to be part, I, I was just a people pleaser and I, I was always trying to avoid conflict. It's kind of where that storyline of Barney comes from. Um, but realizing like speaking your mind is good. People who've hired you have hired you because they want to hear from you and want your say. So even if people are worried about being annoying, <laughs> It's always good to um, say what's on your mind and never more important than working remotely. Like things that you may have spotted in a studio might be harder to spot on Slack or Google Hangout meetings. Um, so that was a bit of a rambled response, but it's the way of saying that I can't even like list the amount of things I've learned from this production. Like, truly a baptism of fire when it comes to running a show. Um, but I haven't left it thinking, oh, never again. I've left it thinking, God, if I got the chance again, there'd be so much I would have, I could bring to it having learned so much. So I think we all feel that way, that we, if we had the chance again, we could go do even better. Yeah, Definitely, I mean, yeah. trying to be an assertive and like, be able to say no, it's also a good thing sometimes. I was the department that was saying mostly no, I was the annoying one, yeah. <laughs> usually. But yeah, that yeah, was, that's it was true. like to save other stuff. So it's like, let's, let's pick what we want to do in the best way possible, but also what we can do. So yeah. if there were a problem, talking, talk about the problems and, you know, as an early stage as you could, because then they could become very huge. So like fix the problems at the start, if you see some. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I think we could kind of all relate to is that since we were doing our meetings and stuff, obviously on the, on the Zoom call, you, you kind of, miss that human element of being in the room with someone and being able to read the room and um like in a tech review or in like a or a friday um heads of department meeting where we're kind of discussing how the show is going we could all tell the camera like yeah this is how things are going or like if we were like oh we're gonna do this this week or we're gonna try this this week or maybe we're gonna, be, we're gonna try and do something else like normally when you're in a room with other people if you can kind of feel that maybe another head of the department or maybe um a showrunner or a producer is kind of like maybe we don't want to go that way or like if you can just kind of feel the tone you can stop and just be like oh hey I'll just ask but you can't really do that kind of stuff on a video call where you can't read anyone's tone so you just kind of have to hope that um everyone is being as literal as possible in their responses and how they and how they feel about things or everyone is speaking up and um I feel like um I definitely learned uh that not everyone's inside my head so you know the things that are obvious to me won't necessarily be obvious to other people and even though I feel like um I am generally on productions try to call things out try to be outspoken try to be like oh this might not be a good idea or this could go the other way I was learning um I was finding out what I didn't know and I was trying and I was learning to get comfortable with what I didn't know and also what I didn't know so I could be confident in the kind of things I was pointing out and as I just like left this production and joined others especially from um a lead point of view of like helping other character designers kind of get to grips with how something should be in terms of like oh we should draw it like this or um this is the best kind of practice to approach something um so many of those details are almost by like reflex when you're when you're learning how to do them yourself so then you kind of have to learn as a lead how to break down your process in your own head put it into words and make it digestible for someone else and kind of really have some empathy and understand that they might be working a completely different way and um the thing that's obvious to you might not be obvious to them and so you have to be really careful about how you describe 
that information because I think it's in those conversations that you can either make someone feel like they're excited to work on the work or you could accidentally make them feel small because they don't know something that you don't know and um, just with the way you deliver the information what's obvious to you isn't obvious to them sometimes and so I've found on like um this year because I've been freelancing so I've been working on studio projects like um did Andy I've been working in development but um, there's been a time when I did some mentoring for like another younger character designer. And um, I just had to kind of remember my, myself, like they're in a different spot in their journey. And like the things that I figured out, I can't take that for granted in terms of like, they might not, they might, it might not click for them. So that was the kind of thing that I learned a lot. I think from being a lead um, definitely was just trying to kind of have empathy for um, the juniors or people who maybe have not had the exact same experiences in terms of their learning and development and kind of just keeping my mind, definitely. Yeah. One of the biggest um, surprises for me when making the show was I always thought of myself as a kind of friendly guy and um, realizing that people who'd never met me who had joined this project remotely were by default a bit scared of the showrunner. So when I would make an attempt to like bond with people and send them a message saying, hi, want to talk? they would see like oh god what's wrong i'm fired what's happening i'm this is terrifying when i was just like trying to make friends so it's just the, the challenges of virtual working and working from home it's really tough it takes away that human element but uh well well done for creating the show and getting through it because uh, I definitely enjoyed watching it and I've enjoyed listening to all your wisdoms um, and before we wrap up um, I'd like to hear um, all of your like quick tips for our rise up in animation mentees um, so we could go around um, who wants to start with their quick tip anyone as, um, I need to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> As my job is mostly pitching shows at the moment, um, I kind of always have this um, quick tip. I, <laughs> that's what you said. Um, is pitching a show as a job interview. It's the idea itself is important, but it's not as important as giving someone confidence that you can run a show. And I think... I see sometimes these great, great, great project ideas from people who are already quite self-defeating and I know it's really hard to get out of it, but if just for like half an hour when you're pitching the show, if you can say, this show is going to be great and I'm going to be the best person for the job, that's, um, I think, the best you could do. I'll go yeah, next. One. Oh, go, oh. go. Ha, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um... Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, this is like a bit of advice for people who want to become art directors, or I think in the US, it's more like production designers. Um, throw the ego out of the door. It does not belong. It does not belong in that position. Um, being an art director or kind of any any kind of lead in in design where you are managing people is all about finding the joy and finding the, um, like, what could be through other people's artwork and designs and bringing it together to, you know, create something uh, consistent and tangible for the stories that you're, the story that you're trying to tell. It's not about you. You are there to um, take, you know, take that talent and take those skills and um, make, like, the best use of it and bring it out as best as possible. Yeah, holy, holy advice. Remove your ego because it could damage you. And my other tip is um, as a maybe young student that wants to work in animation and also in general, share what you do with others, show it to the others, any drawings you do, anything, even if you're a music comp composer share it with the others and take feedbacks from them so be aware that you're gonna have also like retakes correction and advices about other people 
other people will never get what you do or what you intend to do. So just take it because it's not a negative feedback. That one is like a, a positive feedback to make you, oh, they didn't understand me. So how could I be more clear about what I want? Or like take always critics as a, in a positive way to grow. That's it. I feel like my piece of advice would be um, to people who haven't entered the industry yet, like students or people who want to enter into junior level jobs, is to not to get too wrapped up in like worrying about um, networking or do I need to know this piece of software or I feel like it's very easy to get caught up in, you know, things like that. Um, but my advice would be just like the the importance of just just having a couple of good pieces in your portfolio if you want to get into backgrounds that is or design or layouts um, would be just to focus on the work and just put the time into emailing cold emailing studios cold emailing you know people on LinkedIn um, and just don't worry about the small stuff don't worry about the networking like like in person or anything like that um, just focus on what you love to do which is drawing um similar to melissa and i guess this goes out to like uh people who carry designs who want to join carry the design and want to get into the industry in that sense um i think the one of the best things you can do and to get your work in a way that's kind of industry ready is to be super deliberate and kind of remember the fact that as a designer as a character designer you're not just drawing your problem solving that's the design element your problem solving so i see a lot of people um ask questions about like oh how do I find my style and stuff like that? And um, I personally, not to like pat myself on the back, but to suggest that I never did think about style and when I was drawing or when I was developing, instead I was kind of thinking about how, what problems was my, what kind of problems was my work solving? And um, that is what style is a lot of the time when we kind of create the dead end of style or any of the other shows that we're working on, nine times out of 10 style isn't for style's sake and style is actually because we're, responding to a medium we're responding to constraints we're responding to how much time we have to work in and so like style develops based on like how you are working so um if you're a character designer who really likes tv um chances are you're going to have to be good with drawing with line which sounds super obvious but you'd be surprised by the amount of people who work in a way that's more like feature um design so like more color more paint more more less about line less and more about shape and um, more about rendering and then they'll apply to a CV job, not really putting two and two together that now that they've gotten the job, they have to use line and they have to be good with using line and describing all those things they like to describe with that thing. And if you want to work in future, do the opposite, right? So um, I would just, yeah, suggest to people that you'll find that you will develop so much faster when you kind of have deliberate goals of I'm drawing this character and it's going to be used like this. I'm drawing this character because I, I imagine him in a 2D animated show with this particular approach. Or I'm, you know, if you kind of give yourself goals like that and work towards it like that, I find that you'll develop your work in a way that will be kind of like towards an industry standard, thinking about how your work will be used, not just what you want to draw, but how your work will be used and consumed and seen by others is a really useful way to kind of get yourself into a good mindset of um working in an animated industry professional kind of way. So I would definitely recommend that as an approach, I think. Yeah. All right. And that is our conclusion to a sit down with Dead End Paramal Paranormal Park uh, career team. So I want to thank uh, once again, Maria for uh, putting us all together and Ilaria, Ryu, uh, Melissa, Dom, Doma and Hamesh from uh, visiting us today at Rise of Animation. And uh, I also want to thank our audience, hi, uh, who are out there. And um, I just want to say, um, as someone who is well close to 40 than it was 30 and trying to break into the industry myself, um, trying to break into animation is not like an island. You have to reach out uh, to not only your uh, mentors, but also your peers, and just be a nice person or a good person. And if you work hard and you listen to people uh, feedback um, and apply it, uh, good things will happen. And who knows, it might be something even better, but 
uh, that concludes our panel. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, morning, night, whatever uh, time zone you're in. And I will see you soon. And we'll all see you later. So bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 <laughs> see you later. Go watch Dead End on Netflix. <laughs> Season two. <laughs> <Dead end. laughs>